I also wanted to, to say hearing Gil speak about George Crum and his impact on American music, I think it's a kind of beautiful symmetry that Gil himself, 40 years ago, in 1979, premiered Apparitions. And this evening, 40 years later, he's premiering Eric's piece. Um, so he has also had an incredible impact on American music. Um, so, and also, just to let you know, there'll be a short question and answer session after the performance. So if any of you want to, to stick around for a few minutes, that would be great. Thank you. And um, my great pleasure to introduce Eric Nathan. It's wonderful being here in such a beautiful space. Oh, so this piece, Some Favored Nook, uh, is inspired by a, a story, in a sense, of two people, Emily Dickinson, who was uh, unknown during her day, but now we know as uh, one of our greatest poets in the US, the world, and uh, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who was who is unknown, relatively unknown today, but was very famous in his day. He was a noted, noted essayist. He was also the commanding officer of the first black regiment in the Civil War, the first South Carolina volunteers. Um, he was a noted advocate for uh, women uh, poets and uh, helped found Radcliffe College in Cambridge, Mass. And so he also uh, published Emily Dickinson's collected poetry after she passed away, introducing it to the world. He was uh, instrumental in that effort. So Dickinson and Higginson had a 24-year correspondence. Um, Dickinson wrote initially to get advice on improving uh, herself as a poet. Um, and this continued over uh, through the Civil War and, and up until Dickinson's death. And so in this uh, song cycle, I'm, telling this story um, of two struggles, one of Dickinson as a woman poet in the Civil War era in a very patriarchal society, and Higginson's struggle for abolition, abolition of slavery, fighting on the Union side in the uh, Civil War. And so the texts are taken from the letters that Higginson sent to, I mean, that Dickinson sent to Higginson, um, and also poems that she sent to him, or also poems that she wrote around this, the time period. And uh, since all of Higginson's letters back to Dickinson were burned by uh, Dickinson's family after she passed away, uh, I've set instead uh, texts uh, excerpted from essays that uh, Higginson wrote, and also his diary entries from uh, his uh, book, Life on, in a Black Army Regiment. And so uh, the piece is in three parts. It begins with uh, Dickinson, kind of her, her story, and then in the second part, we venture into the Civil War where they're continually corresponding. And then they finally meet in 1870 um, for the first time, and they only meet one time after that. So I um, hope you uh, enjoy.
Mr. Higginson, are you too deeply occupied to say if my verse is a The letter was postmarked Amherst in a handwriting so peculiar as if the writer might have taken her first lessons by studying fossil bird tracks. <laughs> There was a little. She used chiefly dashes, but the most curious thing was the total absence of a signature. As if the shy writer wished to recede as far as possible from view. In pencil, not in ink. Enclosed in the letter were poems, one with an aerial lift that bears the ear upward with a bee it traces.
did not evade the school boy more than she evaded me. It is hard to say what answer was made by me. I remember to have ventured on some criticism.
Seek the command of colored troops, but it sought me. I had always looked for the arming of the blacks. I had been an abolitionist too long. Feel the th 
thrill of joy at last in finding myself in the position where he only wished to be.
president's emancipation proclamation was read. There suddenly rose a strong male voice cracked and elderly into which two women's voices instantly
attending to the wounded, making stretchers for those to be carried. One man killed instantly by ball through the heart, seven wounded, one of whom will die, another with three wounds, one of which may cost him his life, would not report himself till compelled to do so by his officer. While dressing his wounds, he quietly talked of what they had done and of what they yet could do. He is perfectly quiet and cool, but takes his whole affair with the religious bearing. that freedom is sweeter than life. dusty mass should prove the weakness of the nation or its strength must depend in great measure we knew upon our efforts till the blacks were 
at last, after many postponements, on August 16, 1870, I found myself face to face with my hitherto unseen correspondent at her father's house. I heard an extremely faint Pattering footstep like that of a child. And in gliding, almost noiselessly, a plain. Soon she began to talk almost constantly. If I read a book and it makes my whole body so cold, no fire can ever warm me. I know. First, with these confidences came phrases putting into words what the most extravagant might possibly think without saying. If I feel physically as in the top of my head only once again we corresponded for years she sometimes enclosed flowers or fragrant leaves with a verse or two
Oh, 